every other week at this top security test center in Southern California. Former shuttle astronaut Joe Engel buckles into the pilot seat of a truly remarkable aircraft and prepares to blast off into orbit. The craft he will be piloting will accelerate to speeds of over 15,000 miles per hour before finally boosting into the empty stillness of space. Or at least that's what the supercomputers here think is happening. For this is the X-30 simulator, a full-scale, real-time mock-up of what will be the fastest plane ever to take off from a runway. It's part of a dream, a vision of what aviation technology might achieve only a few years from now. If this experimental X-plane can demonstrate the ability to fly directly into space from a runway on Earth, it will represent an advance in aerospace technology that is as far beyond the present day space shuttle as the shuttle is beyond the very first powered aircraft built by the Wright brothers just nine decades ago. They were dreamers too. But even Orville and Wilbur Wright could not have foreseen where their dream would lead as they began to turn their attention from manufacturing bicycles to constructing a machine that might fly. And fly it did at a speed of just under seven miles per hour. At the time, skeptical citizens called for these newfangled contraptions of wire and wood to be banned, proclaiming that they would frighten the horses. But nothing could quench those early aviators' thirst for adventure or the fame and fortune that accompanied each successful flight. In 1909, an injured Louis Blériot braved the icy waters of the English Channel to fly from Calais to Dover at the then breathtaking speed of 45 miles per hour. Air racing had become an international affair and the world talked of little else for days. In the USA, motorcycle ace Glenn Curtis added an airspeed record to his other achievements by clocking fully 47 miles per hour through the air. In Britain, in 1908, monoplanes and biplanes competed for coveted speed prizes. For some, the competition was more bruising than for others. Although any landing you can walk away from is a good one. But nothing accelerates technological development quite as much as armed combat. And in 1914, what was described as a little trouble in the Balkans flared into the bloodbath that was World War I. For the first time, flying machines began to be mass-produced, although those early warplanes were almost as lethal to their pilots as to any adversary. They were so unpredictable and unforgiving to fly. One in three would-be aviators died in training. But while the war below was stagnating into a gruesome slugging match, the skies above were filling with swarms of newer, faster aircraft rising like mayflies above the carnage below. Like the pre-war air racing heroes, the pilots who flew them became as famous as film stars. Dubbed aces by the French fighter pilot Roland Garraud, the term was to become synonymous with flying prowess. Indeed, it was the combination of skill, tactics, and surprise, rather than speed, which determined the outcome of many of these encounters, since very few World War I aircraft could manage much more than about 100 miles per hour. The lumbering, multi-engine bombers, which entered the war in its final months, couldn't even reach those speeds. But what they could do was carry an increasingly greater weight of bombs over increasingly longer ranges. It's debatable whether the advent of the airplane had much effect on the outcome of this First World War. 
but it's clear that that war had a major effect on aviation. In Europe, within months of the armistice, the bombs that these aircraft were designed to carry had been replaced by fare-paying passengers. As Blario had shown just 10 years earlier, the quickest way of crossing the channel between England and France was by air. Flights from London to Paris became a practical and fashionable reality. In that same year, 1919, two British aviators, John Alcock and Arthur Witten Brown, took on a much larger stretch of water, the North Atlantic, and made the first successful flight from Newfoundland to Europe. It was a recklessly heroic, if essentially irrelevant, gesture, which ended somewhat ignominiously in an Irish peat bog. Still, they were celebrated for their courage and endurance. The flight had taken 16 hours and 28 minutes in a Vickers Vimy World War I bomber filled to the brim with fuel. But in America, it was not until Charles Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic and arrived where he said he would, when he said he would, that aviation as a safe, dependable, and speedy mode of transport came to be taken seriously. Barely five months after that epic flight, a brave band of 14 passengers boarded this curious little tri-motored aircraft in Key West, Florida, to make one of the first scheduled flights by an American airline. The flight was a short hop to Havana. Although the amenities were a bit spartan, the tri-motor was able to slash over six hours off the more traditional sea voyage. As the 30s dawned, intrepid travelers could journey to destinations throughout the Caribbean and South America. But with their wicker seats and silver service, these stately flying boats, the famous Pan Am Clippers, were anything but fast. The quest for speed remained the exclusive preserve of that special breed, the Air Racer. On December 7, 1931, Lowell Bales had set his heart on bettering the 270 mile per hour world airspeed record in the treacherous but powerful GB Racer. On his first attempt, he did exactly that, but only by a slim margin. This caused him to turn and make a second try. Briefly, he became the first pilot to break the 300 miles per hour barrier before losing control of the capricious GB and his life. It was a price these early test pilots all too often had to pay. The 1930s were a time of great transition in aeronautics. We had uh, major developments take place in the field of aerodynamics and in propulsion that greatly influenced the subsequent design of aircraft. It was the heyday of air racing. Air racing aircraft in the 1920s and 1930s were very much what we would consider the X-series airplanes of the present day. They were technology demonstrators and gave you an indication of where the technology was heading that would be applied to production military and civilian aircraft subsequently. For example, we had the supermarine racers, of course, in Great Britain, which played a very great role in pushing us toward the 400-mile-an-hour airplane, which really enfolded and encompassed a lot of these technical developments into a single design package that anticipated the World War II fighter. The 400-mile-per-hour supermarine S-6B seaplane was the offspring of one of the most inspired marriages in aeronautical history. The elegance of her streamlined design and the potent punch of her power plant were the products of two visionary engineers, R.J. Mitchell and William Royce of Rolls-Royce Engines. They supported the seaplane, although the British government had failed to perceive the value of air racing. It was to prove a momentous decision since war clouds were threatening and Britain lacked a powerful engine or a plane in which to fit it. The aircraft which Rolls and Mitchell produced was revolutionary, agile yet fast, with a top speed of nearly 400 miles per hour. Like the supermarine race plane, it was to be a winner. It was called the Spitfire. Across the channel, 
As the German Luftwaffe flew in swastika formation across the sky, the buildup of Nazi power in Europe seems now to have been an unmistakable indication of Hitler's ambitions, although it didn't seem so at the time to some. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. The paper proclaiming peace in our time was, of course, worthless. In the early days of the Second World War, the Luftwaffe was perfecting the techniques of the Blitzkrieg. They were equipped with fighters like the ME-109, which were a few miles per hour faster than the Spitfire. But speed was no more the deciding factor here than it had been over the trenches in World War I. Agility, training, and tactics were still the final arbiters. But while pilots dueled to the death in the skies over Europe, scientists on both sides were coming to the conclusion that there was a limit to the improvements that could be made to a propeller-driven aircraft. Basically, as a propeller-driven aircraft approached, say, 500 miles an hour, you started having an abrupt uh, decrease in the efficiency of the propeller. And added to this was the fact that these propeller-driven aircraft, despite their relatively clean lines, in terms of the aerodynamics required for high-speed flight were actually rather clunky. They generated a lot of drag. So we were at the point in the late 1930s where we were ready for a quantum leap. And that quantum leap, of course, was the Messerschmitt 163. This tiny aircraft represented a radical new departure for both propulsion technology and aerodynamic design. So secret was this aircraft that its pilots were not allowed to see it until their first flight. So new was its design that this aircraft proved to be almost unflyable. But when it did fly, its chemical rocket and swept wings made it the fastest machine in the air. Royal Navy test pilot Eric Brown flew a captured ME-163 at the end of the war. This was really a sensational aeroplane. With swept wings, a rocket engine, and incredible speed. It actually had a top speed of 600 miles per hour. It was really untouchable as regards speed by any enemy fighters. We were aware of sweep back in theory, but it was not used in aeronautical design in practice at that time. So we had a revelation here on how much faster an aircraft could go with swept back wings. The theory underlying the high-speed capabilities of swept wings had been understood by aeronautical engineers for some time. But this was probably the first example of that theory being put into practice. It was well known that as a plane travels faster and faster, a pressure wave will build up on the top of the wing when the molecules of air simply can't get out of the way quickly enough. This problem also affects propellers, which are simply long, narrow, thick wings, and is the reason why they lose their efficiency if they rotate at too high a speed. But broad, thin wings don't experience this pressure buildup until considerably faster speeds are reached, and then much less severely. Essentially, a swept wing cheats the oncoming air into behaving as if it were passing over a broader, thinner wing, and so the aircraft can travel more swiftly through the air. But despite its spectacular speed, the swept wing ME-163 was limited to just 300 seconds of flight and an interception range of 22 miles. As a warplane, it was practically useless. But the engineers at Messerschmitt had been working on a descendant of the little 163 and had come up with an altogether more potent machine, the swept wing turbojet-powered ME-262. 
The ME262 arrived on the scene a little later than, but not much later than the 163. But in my opinion, it was the most formidable aircraft produced in World War II. It had exceptionally good performance for its time. It also had swept wings, not quite as heavily swept as the 163, but 18 and a half degrees of sweep, whereas the ME 163 had 23. Nevertheless, this was an incredibly fast aircraft, twin jets, and it had a top speed of 540 miles per hour. This aircraft was in a league by itself. It was virtually untouchable. I think that what the uh, Messerschmitt 262 really indicated in terms of military aviation technology was that the era of the uh, jet fighter had definitely arrived and from that point on uh, propeller driven fighter aircraft would be totally obsolescent and indeed, uh, indeed obsolete. At about the same time, Top secret trials of the first American jet aircraft were being held at Muroc Army Airfield in California. Known only as the XP-59A, such was the secrecy surrounding this first jet, that it even sported a fake propeller to deceive onlookers. Its two gas turbine engines were copies of a British design, which had been smuggled across the Atlantic in 1942. Both the engines and the aircraft were an instant success. Like the X-planes that were to follow after the war, the XP-59 was a classic technology demonstrator, an amalgam of old-fashioned aerodynamics and newfangled jet turbine technology. And the lessons learned from it spawned a generation of jet fighters. In post-war Britain, captured German technology was incorporated into a vigorous high-speed research program. And this Messerschmitt 163 lookalike, the de Havilland Swallow, took to the air to explore flight at speeds of over 600 miles per hour. On the evening of Friday, September 17, 1946, test pilot Jeffrey de Havilland took the pretty little Swallow for a check flight prior to a world speed record attempt planned for the following day. He was never seen alive again. The Swallow, it was later learned, disintegrated in midair, a victim of the aerodynamic difficulties encountered when the speed of an object approaches the speed of sound. Curiously, it was far from being a new problem. The year was 1740 and King George of England had commanded mathematician Benjamin Robbins to study the physics of cannon fire. One of the questions Robbins tried to answer was how far a cannonball would carry for any given quantity of gunpowder. Painstakingly, he measured out larger and larger amounts of explosive. And as might have been expected, the more powder Robbins used, the farther the shot carried. What he hadn't expected was that above a certain amount, the cannonball wouldn't go any farther. With extraordinary insight, he concluded that air resistance was the problem. Unwittingly, he had discovered the sound barrier. What we call sound is a fluctuation in pressure passing through the air between the source of the noise and our ears moving at around 760 miles per hour. In the 19th century, Viennese physicist Ernst Mach recognized that any moving object will cause waves of air pressure to radiate from it at the speed of sound. If the object itself is traveling at the speed of sound, it will experience an abrupt buildup of pressure, a shock wave in the air. Since Mach's day, his name has been adopted in aviation as a measure of speed, and anything traveling at the speed of sound is said to be traveling at Mach 1. That's what was happening to Robin's cannonballs. 
It's also what happened to Geoffrey de Havilland's ill-fated swallow. Apparently, the shock wave that built up over the swallow's wing as it approached the sound barrier caused a wedge of high-pressure air to immobilize the control surfaces. And shortly after that, an oscillating pressure wave above and below the wing caused the controls to flutter like a flag, literally shaking the aircraft to pieces. Back in California, the legendary X-1 rocket plane was being prepared to make its assault on the apparently impenetrable sound barrier. Carried aloft under the belly of a converted B-29 bomber, the X-1 was modeled on the streamlined shape of a 50 caliber bullet and was literally a flying laboratory which would use the skies as its wind tunnel. The pilot on this historic flight was a young Air Force major by the name of Chuck Yeager. Neither he nor the X-1's designers knew what would happen as he opened the throttles on the rocket plane. As Yeager neared the speed of sound, he too encountered the notorious shock waves building up over the tiny straight wings of the X-1. But by applying more power, Jaeger found that the aircraft became more responsive. He'd passed through the hazardous transonic speed range and had broken the sound barrier. As Chuck Jaeger performed a victory roll on his approach to the Muroc test base, everyone agreed he had the right stuff. The date was October 14, 1947, and a new era of aviation had begun. The X-1 made contributions both in the psychology of flight and to the actual technology of flight. In the psychology of flight, it ended forever. It crumbled, really, the notion that there was a sound barrier beyond which further flight would be impossible. In terms of the technology, because the X-1 was a heavily instrumented aircraft, we learned a great deal about the actual physics of transonic and supersonic flight and the requirements for design of successful supersonic airplanes, especially in the area of stability and control. Throughout the late 40s and early 50s, a host of military aircraft sprang from the X-1 research. Jet fighters entered service, and what had been a quest for speed became a hungry need for speed. Faster, higher, new shapes were springing off the drawing board and into life at a staggering rate, fueled by the anxieties of the Cold War. Squadrons of aircraft capable of exceeding the speed of sound were commissioned and built, and some even saw combat in the first jet war, Korea. But the military's fascination for speed seemed to find no echo in the civilian marketplace. Commercial air transport was booming, and the world was becoming ever smaller as new routes opened to destinations many had only vaguely heard of in geography class. But a need for speed? It didn't seem so until this new shape, the de Havilland Comet, graced the skies over the Farnborough Air Show in 1951. At the time, the British were convinced they had a world beater on their hands. Turbojet powered with swept back wings, hydraulic controls, and a fully pressurized cabin. This aircraft incorporated many significant firsts in its design. Too many, some observers thought. But eager passengers enjoyed being whisked from one corner of the empire to another at over 500 miles per hour. But the British were to pay a terrible price for being the pioneers of jet powered civil transport. In 1954, two comets disintegrated in mid-air, and while the scientists struggled to discover what had happened, the entire fleet was grounded. It was a very, very serious um, situation for the industry. It was serious because the flagship of, of another first, uh, the first jet passenger airplane, was, was in trouble. It took a long time to find out what was really wrong, to redesign the parts that were wrong, and to, uh, to get Comet 4 uh, into the air. 
And of course, by that time, the lessons coming out of Comment had been learned by everybody. They'd not just been learned by de Havilland or, or the British uh, industry. They'd been learned by our uh, rivals, as it was then in the United States, who, uh, on the back of uh, a military program, uh, were developing the 707. On July 15, 1954, the Boeing 367-80, a military transport which later became the 707, took to the air over Seattle. It was just three months since the British Comet had been withdrawn from service. Boeing had invested heavily in the new aircraft and was eager to attract the attention of the airlines. It took over a year, but in late 1955, Pan American Airways canceled their order for three British Comets and ordered 20 Boeing 707s instead. So it was the 707 and not the Comet which proved to be victorious in the race to introduce jet travel. A victory which the airlines were only too happy to share with their new jet set passengers. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. This is your captain. Welcome to the jet age. We're cruising now at 35,000 feet. Our speed is Mach number 0 0.83, or about 605 miles per hour. On our flight plan today. But while the new jet setters settled back to enjoy the experience of hurtling through the air at speeds that would have been unthinkable only a decade earlier, others were preparing to venture even further into the unknown realms of high-speed flight. The aircraft was an experimental Delta Wing jet, which would be piloted by a young commercial test pilot named Peter Twiss. The object? To be the first to fly at over a thousand miles per hour. Over 30 years later, Twist recalls what really lay behind the record attempt. Well, our main aim was to uh, try and be the first to push the world airspeed records up into four figures. We thought that would make a great impact on the, uh, the world generally and certainly would have helped the firm. So we had to keep this very secret because we knew the Americans were probably capable of doing it. We wanted to be the first. But as Peter Twist discovered, reaching a thousand miles per hour wasn't the problem. The problem was proving that he had done it. Um, it took us seven attempts to actually achieve it, mainly due to difficulty in spotting the aircraft from the ground, because we were flying at 40,000 feet. And they had to track the aircraft through a little sort of sight. And it was a pretty small target at that height, traveling at the speed it was. So we had one or two failures on that. And finally, we got it on the last flight. Inevitably, the supersonic test flights created very loud sonic booms over the whole of southern England. And as Peter Twist is first to admit, these exploits were often met with a rather mixed reception. Delight from the schoolboys, but uh, a certain number of people, particularly the tomato growers in Hampshire, who had their glass houses, were not amused. And uh, we had a, um, one man who was down in, uh, uh, in Hampshire, certainly used to claim compensation regularly for the loss of his tomato crop. High above the remote California desert, the relentless exploration of high-speed flight was continuing with the X-Plane program. But the quest for speed has always had disaster and tragedy for close companions, and this day was to prove no exception. Making his first flight in the swept-wing X-2 rocket plane, Captain Milburn Apt had been briefed to explore its ultra-high-speed flight characteristics. Doing so killed him. The cockpit camera shows that he was the first pilot in history to reach Mach 3 before losing control of the aircraft. Buffeted by G-forces that would soon render him unconscious, he struggled to eject, but never made it. Resigned to such disasters and undaunted by their frequency, the X-Plane program continued to provide invaluable research data 
on the limits of high-speed flight. And by the late 1950s, the scientists, engineers, and pilots were preparing to fly the 15th aircraft of the series. The X-15 was a rocket-powered space plane designed to blast into the upper reaches of the atmosphere at speeds of up to Mach 8 and then glide down, if glide is the word, to the dry lake bed test site hundreds of thousands of feet below. It was, by all accounts, an exhilarating ride, although, as test pilot Scott Crossfield recalls, you didn't always have to leave the ground in the X-15 to have an exciting time. Prior to flying the, uh, the airplane with the first big engine in it, which was a 60,000 pound thrust rocket engine, I get in the cockpit to make a ground run and everybody else gets into blockhouses. That's called building the confidence of the pilot. Well, on this ground run, which is the last ground run we were to make before the first flight, the airplane blew up. And it blew the front end of the cockpit, the cockpit and the instrument bay of the airplane about 20 or 30 feet forward. And I claim that's the shortest, highest thrust flight ever made by man and they never would let me log the time. But anyway, it was like sitting in the sun. And in this very bright orange surrounding me, the fire truck began to move in and began to get dark with just a wall of water in front of me. And in the bottom of that wall of water was one of my mechanics, Art Simone was his name, and I still choke up a little bit because he was coming into that hollow cost risking his life to save mine. And I'm in a very well-designed temperature resistant structure he's out there in that fire well i tried to wave him away and he wouldn't go away he tried to open the canopy and i could see his fingers were searing on the hot fuselage when he tried to get the handle open so the only choice i had since he wouldn't stop doing that was to open the canopy and i didn't want to crawl across that hot fuselage so i jumped out and landed on top of him we rolled in the water and got all wet and ran out of there, really none the worse for wear except the burns on his hands. Before we could call the factory and <clears throat> tell them that we'd just blown up a $50 million airplane, the newspaper started calling. And I wanted to calm them down and I said, hey, relax, the only casualty was the press of my trousers when the fireman got me wet. And then, of course, I winced when I realized what I'd given the bastards. And so sure enough, the next day, an East Coast newspaper had a headline, X-15 blows up pilot wet's pants. Exploring the frontiers of high-speed flight was taking the X-15 to even higher altitudes. And many believe that these X-planes were laying the foundation for flight into space. Were you an engineer in the early 1950s and somebody asked you, how will we approach flight into space? I think the answer you would have given would be, we will fly at increasingly high altitudes and increasingly high Mach numbers until eventually we will transition from flight within the atmosphere to flight in space. But as the X-15 pilots were winning their astronauts' wings by flying to altitudes of over 70 miles, the politicians were dreaming of even more distant, more challenging destinations. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. The effect of that speech was profound. At a single stroke of the presidential pen, the aerospace engineers who had planned to fly men into space now focused on blasting them there atop a modified intercontinental ballistic missile.
On back light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. By the time men were walking on the moon, the X-15 program had been closed and research into ultra-high-speed flight was at a standstill. But the lessons learned from the X-planes had not been in vain. In the same year that John Kennedy vowed to put a man on the moon, a truly remarkable aircraft commissioned by the Central Intelligence Agency was being prepared for its first super secret flight trials. Forged on the anvil of the Cold War, the specifications for this aircraft, the SR-71, remain secret to this day. But we do know that it could fly at speeds in excess of Mach 3, at altitudes of up to 100,000 feet. It is said that throughout its nearly 30 years of operational life, the stealthy SR-71 Blackbird has flown over nearly every square mile of the planet, taking high-resolution photographs for the West's intelligence community. It's also won a fistful of trophies for being the fastest plane in the sky. In 1990, however, it was retired from duty leaving only one other aircraft which regularly clocks as many hours of supersonic flight. Amazingly, it's a commercial airliner, the Concorde. Its regular flights across the Atlantic have opened the once exclusively military supersonic club to hundreds of thousands of civilian passengers. Each has experienced the sensation of winning a race with the sun across the surface of the planet at over twice the speed of sound, more than 100 times the speed of Orville and Wilbur Wright's first flight 90 years ago. But although many hail this graceful bird as a technological marvel, few would deny that it has been a commercial lemon. There were many delays and setbacks before the aircraft entered service in 1976. Its owners, Air France and British Airways, knew that with a capacity of only 100 passengers and barely enough range to cross the Atlantic, it would be a tough job making this elegant creature pay its way. It had taken $5 billion to develop and required a premium fare structure that put it out of reach of all but the few who could afford the $800 ticket cost. The newly introduced 747 jumbo jet was no less than 16 times more fuel efficient. But there'd been more at stake in embarking on the construction of Concorde than simple commercial imperatives. It was also an overtly political creation, intended to cement relations among the nations of a far from united Europe. Concorde was Europe's moonshot. A technical challenge to prove that the catastrophic Comet experience had been an unlucky accident, and to show that European aeronautical expertise was the match of mighty Boeing. The world's first supersonic airliner was the most thoroughly tested civil aircraft ever. And in 1969, the year that man first set foot on the moon, the press gathered at a tiny airfield in the south of France for what some felt was an equally momentous liftoff, Concorde's first flight. 
They all hope that being first in the race to produce a supersonic transport would be a milestone, little expecting that within a few years, all the other runners would drop out. Boeing was struggling to make commercial sense of its Mach 3 stainless steel swing wing design until the engineers discovered that the aircraft could carry either the swing wing pivot or passengers, but not both. Instead, they came up with a 300-seat delta-winged aircraft made of titanium. But by the early 70s, the growing environmental lobby had put the final nail in the American SST's coffin, and the project was shelved. That left only one other contender in the supersonic transport race, a Concorde look-alike built by the Soviets and dubbed Konkortsky. But Konkortsky's troubled history was tragically and publicly evident at the Paris Air Show in 1973 when it broke up in midair. It was withdrawn from service shortly afterwards. Which leaves Concorde alone in the supersonic sky. Many believe this lack of competition has led to the stagnation of supersonic transport development. And there's little doubt that this aircraft would never have been built in the harsher fiscal climate of today's world. All set, everybody? Ready. OK, three, two, one. Now. But it isn't only economic issues which beset Concorde. Her 40-year-old technology makes this aircraft easily the noisiest on any runway it visits. And her massive Olympus turbojet engines produce unacceptable levels of nitrogen compounds, which damage the fragile ozone layer in the stratosphere. Both of these problems might be solved by further research but there's another which almost certainly can't. As the tomato growers of southern England discovered when Peter Twiss made his record-breaking flights 30 years ago, supersonic aircraft create sonic booms as the shock waves they are generating pass along the ground. For this reason, two-thirds of the world's airline routes are denied to the supersonic traveler since they pass over inhabited land. But that doesn't mean that the dream is dead. And in this post-Glasnost world, an intriguing marriage is being proposed. This is the Su-27, a Mach 2 Soviet interceptor codenamed Flanker. Its agility and power are an eloquent testimony to Soviet aeronautical design. The proposition is that the flanker's manufacturer, the Sukhoi Design Bureau, join forces with the American aircraft company Gulfstream to produce a 12-seat supersonic business jet. Because of its small size, such a plane may be able to travel supersonically over land at speeds in excess of Mach 1. The $50 million price tag for this aircraft may seem a little steep. But Gulfstream is confident that around 100 potential customers feel that much need for speed. And no one denies that speed is attractive. In a civil transport world which anticipates a two-fold increase in air travel by the end of the decade, especially across the Pacific, Boeing is still working on perfecting a 300-seat, 5,000-mile, second-generation supersonic aircraft they believe there may be a market for over 1,000 of them. And that old supersonic partnership, French and British industry, is also working on a second generation Concorde. While in Germany, the Mach 5 Zanger designs are receiving serious consideration. But in 1989, 20 years after the realization of John Kennedy's dream of putting a man on the moon, another presidential challenge was laid before the world. So yes, this nation remains fully committed to America's space program. We're going forward with our shuttle flights, we're going forward to build our space station, and we're going forward with research on a new Orient Express that could, by the end of the next decade, 
take off from Dulles Airport, accelerate up to 25 times the speed of sound, attaining low Earth orbit, or flying to Tokyo within two hours. The public was enchanted by the prospect of a two-hour trip from Washington to Tokyo. But whether such a technological leap is possible by the end of the decade, or ever for that matter, is a big unknown. Still, a forerunner of President Reagan's Orient Express is already in the works. The X-30, or National Aerospace Plane. Like all X-Planes, this one is designed to test a range of technologies including new materials and propulsion systems. Its ultimate goal is to develop a new kind of space vehicle, one that would replace the existing mainstay of our space program, the shuttle. On takeoff, the shuttle must lift not only its own weight, but the weight of its fuel as well. Within minutes, that fuel will have been burned, and it will be time to jettison the two auxiliary booster rockets and then the spent fuel tank. Once in orbit, the shuttle's 17,000 mile per hour speed alone keeps it up, weightless. But as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, unpowered, it briefly becomes the world's fastest glider. An impressive achievement, the X-30 designers all agree. But wouldn't it be better if the next space vehicle didn't have to throw away so much expensive equipment on its journey into space? If it could be, to use the jargon, a single stage to orbit vehicle. Uh, with a single stage to orbit vehicle, we can fly directly from, uh, from our point of departure, an ordinary runway, fly straight into orbit without losing or having to throw away any parts of the airplane. And from the perspective of operating costs, simplicity, lower complexity, uh, it has a lot of advantage. But while the advantages are clear, the challenge of flying directly into space is, to say the least, daunting. One of the advantages of staying in the atmosphere is that you can get the oxygen from the air to feed the engines. Um, that means that you don't have to carry that oxygen with you. Now, what goes along with that is the fact that the airplane has to operate at very high speeds in the atmosphere and, as a consequence, sees high temperatures, much, much higher than, than say, uh, a space shuttle or a, 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 a typical expendable rocket would see. Atmospheric heating had been a focus of research since the X-15 program and was a crucial factor in the design of new materials for the shuttle. But the X-30 will experience much higher temperatures than the shuttle and for much longer periods of time. So the materials from which it will be constructed are going to have to be revolutionary. In some parts of the X-30 structure, liquid hydrogen at minus 300 degrees centigrade will be used to cool the inside of the aircraft's skin. But the outside of that panel may be at 3,000 degrees centigrade. These materials must not only be able to survive appalling thermal stress, they must be both very light and very strong. To meet these needs, new titanium and ceramic structures are being developed and new test methods devised to explore their capabilities. This is the 40 megawatt argon plasma wind tunnel in which the combined effects of high temperatures and aerodynamic loads on some of the more vital engine parts can be analyzed together. But a further problem plagues the X-30 designers. Exotic as these tests may seem, it's almost impossible to actually duplicate the flight conditions which the X-30 or its engines will experience as it hurtles through the atmosphere at Mach 25. None of the wind tunnels currently available to scientists can produce such air speeds for anything more than a few milliseconds, and sustained high-speed facilities beyond Mach 8 simply don't exist. To solve such problems, supercomputers are used to create imaginary wind tunnels, 
numerical laboratories in which data from a host of separate flash tunnel tests is integrated into an overall picture of the pressures and temperatures the X-30 and its components will experience. Supporters of the National Aerospace Plane believe that within another year or two, both the material scientists and the aerospace engineers will be confident enough in their predictions for a full-scale aircraft to be constructed. By 1995, the X-30 could make its first flight, and these computer simulations may become a reality. Utilizing data retrieved from astronaut Joe Engel's countless simulator flights, in 1997, the space plane may be flying at Mach 25 to the edge of space and back. If all goes well, by the dawn of the new millennium, the X-30 will be routinely flying into orbit. And then someday, far into the next century, the descendant of this shuttle replacement might become the passenger-carrying Orient Express of President Reagan's imagination. But it takes more than a presidential decree to ensure the success of a project that is this challenging and which will take so long to achieve. It will take a lot of money and a lot of perseverance. And it will also, say the X-30 scientists, take vision. When we crossed the continent, at the turn of the 19th century. We were going from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento in an expendable vehicle, just like we're going to orbit now, called a Conestoga wagon. Very few ever came back. If they did, they needed a great deal of rehab and maintenance. It did allow colonists to go out, but it did not allow for two-way trade. The two-way trade was the, were the ships around the Horn, and it wasn't until the visionaries, the industries, uh, whatever you, robber barons, whatever you want to call them, the railroad people said, we need the government's cooperation, which they did by giving them land grants, and they proceeded to put in a pathway to the west, which was less dependent upon weather, schedulable, lower cost, non-expendable, and more importantly, the trade went both ways. Passengers could come, can go one way, products, gold, cattle could all come back to the east. If we lose the X-30, we lose that vision of a railway to space, and we're going to be stuck with Conestoga wagons. If the X-30 does take to the skies, meeting the enormous technical challenge of flying up to orbit and flying back, then the prospect of that railroad to space will be a major step closer to being a reality. A reality that is the natural successor to those wood and linen contraptions of over 90 years ago, and the direct descendant of those first true space planes, the X-planes, the fastest planes in the sky. We can say that the X-30 is the X-15 of this era, as the X-15 gave us a great deal of understanding about the problems and situations of high-speed flight. The X-30 points the same way toward the future.